what I wanted to start with actually is just a little story. Um, when I was in my early 30s, I worked at Stanford and I um, participated or, or worked on a study of children with Fragile X Syndrome, which is a very common inherited cause of intellectual disability. And we uh, saw families all around the US, so I was flying all over the place and um, assessing the kids and um, their siblings without Fragile X and also the parents. So it was just doing IQ test after IQ test after IQ test like all the time. And um, the thing that really gradually got to be frustrating for me is that um, when I gave the tests, in this case it was the, one of the Wexler scales, to um, the children with Fragile X syndrome, especially the boys who, are, who tend to be much lower functioning, I kept getting the same score all the time. I would get um, the lowest possible score on the test, um, which was 40 for the full scale. And um, at first it was just like, okay, well, that's just you know how these few kids are performing, but it just kept happening over and over again. And I knew that the purpose, one of the purposes of the study was to um, learn about how well variation in the gene um, mutation predicts uh, IQ level and also variation in the home environment. So we were looking at um, like enrichment of learning materials and structure and other things in the home environment and trying to see if not only the gene mutation was contributing to cognitive variation but also um, environmental things. And I knew from taking statistics that we weren't going to be able to really predict any of that variation if there wasn't any variation. Um, and so, yeah, so we actually kept collecting the data and actually the paper um, that was published on it um, had some interesting findings, but there was a high proportion of, of kids who were at the floor of this test. And um, I just kind of put it in the back of my mind, put it on the back burner, like I'd really like to do something about that. Um, and actually, uh, my colleague Bronwyn, who we always had two people traveling um, on these trips, and, and she said, well, what if we just, you know, figured out, because we knew that they were, they had variation in their raw scores, like they were still doing the tasks, um, and there was variation in what they could do, it's just that when you translated it over, you were getting the same score, and she said, well, why don't we just figure out what the actual deviation is? Let's not look at the manual, let's find out what their actual deviation is. And we actually finally got back to that, and I'll tell you more about it later. But that's what really got me interested in this field of assessment, um, I would say, in general. So I do some consulting now for um, some different pharmaceutical companies that are developing um, targeted treatments for Fragile X and Angelman and other syndromes. Um, so those are my disclosures there. One of the reasons that we're really interested in doing a better job with this is that the clinical trials that have been used for um, these syndromes have really relied on parent reports of maladaptive behavior as the main clinical, clinical measure of interest. And that's been used in psychiatry trials for a long, long time. Uh, but what we've realized is that um, there's a lot of subjectivity in uh, parent ratings and teacher ratings and so on. So there's a lot of um, bias in parents' reports. Um, there are big placebo effects in clinical trials um, of kids with neurodevelopmental disorders when the parents are the reporters. So we knew that we wanted to find some more objective measures, and so cognitive ones are, are helpful for that. And then one of the other issues is that behavioral ratings, because they're more diffuse, it's a lot harder to establish links between um, variation in behavioral problems and like the hard objective kind of um, brain activity or neuroscience or of um, cognition uh, or behavior. And so um, cognitive measures, you know, there's a lot better history of drawing those links between, let's say, executive function and frontal lobe activity, that kind of thing. So that's always nice to know. Um, and so some of these issues may explain, at least partially, some of the difficulties we've had finding efficacy in these clinical trials. Also, cognitive deficits are the defining features of intellectual disabilities, of course, and also some of the syndromes that we're most interested in, in um, doing research with and trials with. 
Um, and because of these kind of um, measurement improvements or advantages, they may be more sensitive to changes with targeted treatments um, in these conditions. So for identifying and establishing um, cognitive measures, the bar is set pretty high in terms of, you know, when you think about like what are the things that need to be done in, in, in research to um, be confident that a measure is going to perform well. And so there's a bunch of sort of um, steps that you need to take to achieve that um, high bar. And so I'm just going to go through some of those. Um, now this is going to be obvious to any of you that do testing of kids with any kind of disability. Um, it needs to be feasible, right? So a decent proportion of the people who have the condition need to be able to at least mostly understand what they're supposed to do and to be able to get on the sort of on the board, like um, get some scores, get some points that show that they can do at least the rudimentary aspect of that. Um, and the range needs to be pretty broad, uh, at least for some conditions. So like in autism, we have this giant distribution of uh, levels from uh, often you know, severe intellectual disability all the way to above average. Same with Fragile X. We have um, kids with, uh, who are males with Fragile X who are very low functioning and then females who can be um, right up into the average range. Um, so it helps a lot to ha be able to capture a big range. You want the measure to be reliable over time. So if there's no change in the person's treatment, um, then you would like to, the measurement to be pretty stable. If it's bouncing around a lot, um, just without any changes in their environment or any change with treatment, then it's kind of like finding a, a needle in a haystack. So you have like a lot of noise in the background because of all this variability and you're trying to t you know, find the signal of improvement. So the reliability is really important. Um, a lot of tests have practice effects, so you know, that means you take it once, you, you know, as you're taking it, you're kind of learning how to do it, and then maybe a couple months later, you take it again, and you're like, oh yeah, I, I kind of remember this, and um, it goes a little easier, and so the scores get better, and you, you'd kind of like to avoid that, if possible. And then whatever um, the test is measuring in the lab, or in a clinic, you would like to know that it is actually tapping into something that affects the person's actual daily life, right? So if it's just measuring something interesting in the clinic, but it doesn't really have any bearing on, on them, you know, at school or at home or with their, well, I don't know, with their friends, maybe not the best example for cognition, but um, then that's not as good as if it has, you know, some real impact. And I should say a lot of these, um, kind of issues in terms of measurement are not just applicable for research. So how many people give cognitive tests or neuropsych tests to kids or adults? Okay, so yeah, actually a pretty good number. So a lot of these things apply in a clinic or school setting too. Um, we wanna feel confident that you know, a test is reliable, that it's measuring what we think it is, that it is feasible you know, and ca captures a big range. So all those things are important in those situations. Um, so the two um, syn uh, syndromes that we've spent a lot of time focused on are uh, Down syndrome and Fragile X syndrome. And I think most of you probably know about Down syndrome. Um, it's, you know, one of the most common causes of intellectual disability. Um, there's a phenotype or a con constellation of um, kind of strengths and weaknesses that we see. Uh, planning and goal-directed problem-solving, verbal working memory, cognitive flexibility, and attention are all impacted, especially by Down syndrome. There's also a lot of research on certain types of memory being deficient in, in Down syndrome, especially um, those functions that are mediated by the hippocampus. And actually, I'll, I'll show you some information about how that's studied in the, in the mouse model of Down syndrome. And Fragile X has some overlaps. Uh, so Fragile X is the most common inherited cause of intellectual disability, and it's caused by a mutation on the fMR1 gene, which is on the X chromosome. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about the genetics of Fragile X, because I wanna really focus on the cognitive stuff. But, um, so like Down syndrome, there's executive function deficits, uh, cognitive flexibility problems, working memory problems. 
Um, they also have really uh, profound uh, challenges with number sense and doing math and things like that. Um, so lots of overlap, but then some interesting differences. So um, one of the things that we like to do in what, what we call translational research is to kind of draw links between um, the human condition, the human syndrome, and m animal models that are s supposed to map onto that syndrome. So there's a number of disorders that have an animal model, or more than one animal model, and Fragile X and Down syndrome both have ma uh, mouse models um, where uh, the genetic mutation or aberration is, is similar to humans. And so in Down syndrome, what they've been able to do pretty well is establish some phenotypes with the mice, um, and one of them that is really well replicated is the Morris water maze. And so I have a video that's gonna show you um, kind of how that works in a fun way, and then um, I'll show you how, later I'll show you how that's measured, um, that kind of thing is measured in people with Down syndrome. Okay, so you get a curve, right? So over time, there's multiple trials and, and a mouse that is performing well on this, the curve will be steeper, they'll learn faster, and then mice that have a hippocampus-mediated dysfunction will um, not, oh, okay. So here are the curves with um, control mice and mice with the Down syndrome um, uh, genetic abnormality, and you can see that they're, um, uh, slower at um, getting to criterion, so their slopes are not as steep. Um, so there have been um, clinical trials for uh, people with Down syndrome that are based on this animal model. And so there was a trial by Roche where they gave a uh, medication that's GABA, a GABA mediating medication that was effective in the mouse model, so it actually improved the hippocamp, the, uh, Morris water maze performance on the mice and, and in some other ways. Um, and actually, a trial was done in people with Down syndrome. And they used some tests that were sort of the best available, but not really ideal. So it didn't, uh, the, the uh, R bands test didn't, it measures memory, but not really hippocampal mediated memory and not visual spatial memory so much. Um, and they did not find um, efficacy there. So whether the failure had to do with the outcome measure or the medication is very hard to disentangle. We don't really know what the problem was. Um, and so again, this is happening also in the field of Fragile X where we're having difficulty translating from the, anim the success in the animal models to humans with the syndromes. Uh, Jamie Edgen and her group in Arizona have um, spent a lot of time doing similar work to us, and they um, put together what they call the Arizona Cognitive Test Battery for Down Syndrome, and it's largely based on a battery called the CANTAB, which was developed at Cambridge, and um, it actually does incorporate some tests that are very similar to what's um, done with the uh, Morris water maze. And, in terms of place memory and things like that. 
And so we don't need to go into details, but they've broken it up into tests that tap hippocampal function, prefrontal uh, function, and cerebellar function. You can kind of see some of the ways that they correlate those um, tests to show that they're useful. The problem with the um, Arizona battery was that there was problems with feasibility. So we had, or she had subgroups where the test looked really good and other subgroups where the uh, participants were just not able to do the test at all or didn't understand it. So there seemed to be kind of a um, uh, range of difficulty issue there. And so one of the tests that, um, is, that she used is called the CANTAB, and this is the one that has some kind of parallels with what I showed you with the mice. And so in this test, which you guys can do right here, um, you have these boxes um, that surround a central uh, fixation point, and you'll see that um, the boxes will open up and reveal what's underneath them, and then in the central part, you'll see a symbol, and you have to remember where you saw that symbol and then click on the location. You'll, you'll see how it works. Okay, so now you'd click on where you saw that and where you saw that one. So you can see how there's that spatial array aspect, and so it really um, has been shown to be linked to hippocampus function. The problem is that um, the easiest items on PAL, paired associates learning, are often even too difficult for lots of kids with Down syndrome, and it's sort of too abstract. So um, there, was lim there were limitations there. So, um, as I was kind of combing through all of the literature and all the tests that um, could be useful for our population, I came across the NIH toolbox um, from talking to some colleagues and spent some, a lot of time looking at their website and realized that this could have a lot of utility for us, both in research and possibly in schools and clinics, uh, because it has a very broad uh, range of difficulty from mental age of, age, uh, mental age of three all the way up to um, you know, high functioning adults. Um, and actually the norms go up to age 89. Um, and it's the same test throughout. So unlike lots of cognitive tests where you have to choose different, whole different batteries depending on the person's age, um, this one can be used throughout the age span. Um, and so what does it measure? Uh, in AIM-1 of our study, uh, which is uh, supported by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, um, we're uh, basically studying the toolbox in uh, children and young adults with Fragile X, Down Syndrome, and other types of intellectual disability. And you can see here, it covers executive function, episodic memory, working memory, processing speed, attention, and language. And I should say, those domains were not just kind of randomly chosen by this group. They actually had, if you go to their website, you can see they had like these very extensive um, expert panel meetings for many years with a lot of people debating about what should be included and which are the best tests to be included in each domain. So lots and lots and lots of time was spent trying to find what would be the most, um, kind of have the most applicability across lots of different research questions, but also what has the most scientific support. And this is kind of what they landed on. Um, so we're interested in looking at the sensitivity of this um, battery to detect clinically meaningful differences. So if we know for a given syndrome that they're really, really bad in one thing, uh, like working memory, then we ought to see that in this test and, and those kind of questions. And then we want to see how well the composite score maps on to um, established composites in general population controls. So if this is really um, tapping into all of the important domains of cognition that are recognized as part of intelligence, then we ought to see good correlations with other tests where there's adequate range. Um, and then we also, because of the application of this kind of thing in clinical trials, we want to know if it's measuring changes. Um, and so rather than doing a clinical trial, which is really kind of unwieldy for us to, to add into this project, we are actually just looking at 
um, development of the individuals over a two-year period. Um, and there's some limitations to doing that, but um, that's the best we could come up with without doing a trial. So um, our initial pilot study, we had 60 participants, uh, 20 in each group, uh, but actually in the full validation study, which is going on right now, uh, we have uh, plans to see 150 in each group. Uh, the, the IID, by the way, means um, idiopathic intellectual disability, but since I made this slide, we actually expanded that. So we're now including, um, it's more of a mixed group, kids with a variety of different um, causes of intellectual disability and then comparing them to the two syndromic groups. Um, and there's some details here that, that are not that important probably, but um, we have three sites, um, Chicago, Denver, and here. We do a, a test retest and then the two-year follow-up as I mentioned and then there's some inclusion criteria there. So that gives you a, just a sense of how the study works. Um, here are all the toolbox measures on the left, and you can see a variety of uh, what we call criterion or convergent validity measures on the right, and that's just to be able to say when we see somebody do well on a toolbox test, then they ought to also do well on another test that taps into the same thing. So in study one, we just had a small sample, um, and we only had uh, data on two of the tests, and then in study two, we actually gave the whole battery to a much larger sample. Um, and so let me walk you through the tests. Uh, the first one is a cognitive flexibility test, and all the person does is look at the image on the top, and then they match by either color or shape. And so um, when you match by color, you're choosing the sailboat, and when you're matching by shape, you're choosing the bunny, and then there's different shapes, um, and the way this works is uh, the person um, keeps responding to a particular set, like um, color or shape, and then unexpectedly there's a change and they have to change their thought pattern and respond in the new way. And we measure errors and response time and things like that. So that gives you a sense of um, cognitive flexibility. The flanker test is a attention and response inhibition task where you have this um, array of arrows or fish, and there's two types of trials. There's congruent trials, where all of the arrows or fish point in the same direction, and there's incongruent trials where the flanking fish on each side of the middle fish are pointing in the opposite direction. And your job is to just decide which direction the middle fish is pointing. And it seems like way too simple, and you would think that there's not a lot of variability, but actually it performs really, really well uh, because we look at not only errors, but also um, impulsive responding and um, response times. So there's a special algorithm for scoring this that um, is working really quite well. List sorting is the one that is probably the toughest for our samples. Um, in this test, it's a working memory task, and basically you are seeing and hearing um, an, a group of animals, and you have to report back the size order, right? So the first trial might be elephant, mouse, cat, and your answer should be mouse, cat, elephant. Um, I think the easiest ones start with just two. Um, and then there's items with foods where you tell them in size order, and then as it gets even more difficult, higher functioning participants will get to this part where you hear a mixed group and then you have to order them size order animals and then size order uh, foods. So you have to kind of rearrange it in your head and report it back. Um, so that's list sorting. Oral reading is, this is a, not a good example because it's a very challenging word for our, our participants, but um, they start with just uh, naming either uh, numbers or letters no words, just numbers or letters, and then you get to um, two-word letters, three-word letters, and you're just simply reading the single words. Um, so it's an oral reading, single-word reading test. Picture vocabulary, if you know the PPVT, this is like really, really similar to the PPVT. Uh, you just hear a word and you point to this. This is, by the way, a touch screen, so you're just pointing to the screen um, the picture that goes with it. And um, some of the tests in the battery are what we call CIT, and so the nice thing about that is you start at their mental age point, 
and then it will either drop back if it's too hard or increase if it's too easy, and it will quickly kind of zone in on what that person's level is. And so this test is over in like a few minutes, whereas the PPVT takes, I don't know, I can't remember, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, so it's pretty efficient, and you'll see that it performs really well. Picture sequence memory, this is the one that's a little bit more like the place memory concept I told you before. Um, you hear a story, and the story is told from left to right, like this. Uh, so this one's about a picnic um, at the park. And um, the pictures are presented as the story is told. And then after the story, all the pictures get sort of dumped into the middle there in a mixed up order. And then the participant just moves with their finger the picture where it belongs. It's partly like knowing the story, but it's also knowing where things belong in space. So this is the feasibility data that we got um, from the second study. Um, and you can see that um, we did pretty well on most of the tests, but um, list sort was one of the most challenging in terms of getting valid scores. And so we've been working with the developers to uh, have much more simple uh, instructions so they really understand how to do the test better, more practice items. And that, we, we don't really know for sure, but it looks like there's a higher percentage that can do list sort. It, it, it will probably still be the most challenging one, though. Um, so we talked about reliability, and these are all the reliability figures right here. And so um, it's just looking at performance at test one and test two, and the closer you are to one, um, the better the stability is for the test. And you can see um, we did really well on that, and actually those uh, reliability statistics are at least as high or sometimes higher than what they got actually in the um, in typically developing children, let's say. So we felt really pretty good about that. Um, there were some practice effects you can see here. This means that it was a significant um, improvement on pattern comparison. Um, Patterson comparison is uh, looking at two pictures and deciding if they're the same or not and doing it as quickly as you can. So it's like a processing speed test. So they seem to get better on that test with the second administration. So in this um, more comprehensive um, test that we published, if you want to read all about this, it's in this paper that came out last year. We really spent a lot of time correlating with other tests, but also um, parent reports of behaviors that are related to cognition, so like executive function um, and things like that. And one of the main things that we found is that some of the cognitive tests mapped really nicely onto the toolbox, but the parents' um, ratings of similar constructs were not well correlated. Um, so we're really not feeling good that um, parent or teacher reports will really be useful in kind of grounding this, uh, these type of tests. We have a picture schedule that helps kids um, uh, understand what to expect, you know, what are the tests we're going to do, and then they actually, we put either a prize in the middle or um, like a picture of what they're going to get in the middle. So it could be like a gift card or a toy or something like that, and then it's on a dry erase board and they cross off each one as they do it, and so they know kind of what's next, and um, when they're finished, they're, they're gonna get this prize, and that seems to really help quite a bit. Um, we also have a video that we um, play to help kids um, prepare for the visit. Today, we're gonna show you the Mind Institute. It's a place where you will do some activities that will help us understand how people like you learn. Let's go inside. Once you enter the building, you'll walk down the hall to the research clinic, and there someone will help you and your family check in. The waiting area has games and DVDs that you can watch while you wait. There is also an outdoor playground. During your visit, you will do some activities with us so that we can understand how people learn. Before you begin, you will get to pick a prize that you will get after you finish the activity. You will be given a token board that has a picture of each activity that you will do. After each activity, you will get to check off its box on the board. When you have checked off all the boxes, you will get your prize. First, you will do some activities at a table with one of our friendly staff. 
you will do some puzzles and answer some questions during the activities. After you finish, you'll check off this box on the token board, one step closer to the prize. You will also do some activities on the iPad. You'll sit with the iPad at a table like this. Now that you're done with the iPad, you can check off this box on the token board. You will also do some activities on the computer where you will explore the enchanted castle. All done! You can check off the last activity on the token board and get your prize. We look forward to seeing you during your visit. Anxiety and not being sure what to expect can really make it difficult for the experience, but it can also affect their scores, right? I mean, everybody who's done testing with kids knows, or, or adults knows that's an issue. These data um, show um, how the different tests correlate with um, different dimensions that we're interested in. So um, really pretty strong correlations with mental age and with uh, this deviation IQ um, that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, and um, some modest correlations with adaptive behavior from the Vineland. And so this gives us some assurance that variation in performance on these tasks uh, maps onto kind of more established global measures of cognitive ability and also, um, at least in some areas, may have some um, association with um, daily functioning. So we, here are the, some of the correlations that we do between um, the toolbox measure and something similar to it. And um, for Flanker, we looked at um, uh, a executive function test called the KITAP and um, saw some reasonably decent correlations. Much, much better um, convincing correlations between picture vocabulary and the PPVT. Um, so again, that one looked like it was doing really well. The profiles uh, turned out to be really interesting too. So on the left side is average z-score. And um, if you don't know what a z-score is, it's like one standard deviation, right? So in the general population of kids and adults, the average z-score is zero because that's the middle or the average of the distribution. And so these are data from idiopathic intellectual disability, Down syndrome, fragile X, and then the general population norm you see there is that flat line at zero. So this shows you at, on each test how much of a deviation below normal the group is doing. Um, and it also shows you where their relative strengths and weaknesses are. So there was a major, major, major deficit in the Fragile X group on flanker, which is inhibitory control and attention. And lots and lots of studies have been done showing that that is a huge deficit area with that um, disorder. Um, and the Down syndrome group also had difficulty there compared to the other group. Um, the NS means not significant, meaning that there were no um, really reliable differences between groups on list sorting, pattern com comparison, picture sequence memory, etc. This one is kind of surprising because if kids with Down syndrome have hippocampal deficits, that are worse than uh, you know, the larger population of people with intellectual disability, we would expect to see that score lower. So we're not really sure uh, what that means at this point, um, but with a larger sample, we probably will get a clearer picture. Um, this correlation was also really encouraging. So this is uh, the correlation between the composite score that is generated from the toolbox and the um, Stanford Binet full scale IQ. And I'm going to explain what this Z deviation method is, but basically it allows us to get very, um, uh, reliable and valid variability below the floor, as I was mentioning before. Um, and so this correlation, I think, was about 0.89. And you can see this regression line, which is sort of the best prediction at each point, um, falls really close to where it should be at each. So on the Stanford Binet, a 40 is much like a 40 on the toolbox. And so that also is useful because um, if you've given lots of different tests, you'll know that sometime, some tests seem to give higher scores than others, and you don't really know kind of where you stand. And so um, having that kind of um, be equivalent is good. Um, so what was the feasibility like at different levels of ability, okay? So 
Um, on the left side, you can see mental age. So we have uh, people, and this is, includes adults and teenagers as well. So at a mental age of three and four and five to six and so on, you can see the percentage of participants that gave valid scores. And you can see that um, at, at mental age of three, we're, we're way above half, but there's some variation and, and uh, a higher proportion that can't do it. By age four, um, the feasibility jumps up quite a bit, except for list sorting. And this is before any modifications that we did. Um, by age, certainly by mental age of seven, um, regardless of chronological age, we're getting completely valid data from everybody. Um, so this is not too surprising, but just gives you a feel for um, the utility, I guess, of the battery. In the clinical trials, what we had, as I mentioned or alluded to before, were big problems with uh, behavioral measures. And the placebo effect, well, maybe it's not placebo effect, maybe it's expectancy bias or both, right? So if you have a, if you're a parent of a adult or a child in a clinical trial and that person has an intellectual disability of some type or a syndrome, um, you really are hoping that it's gonna work. Um, and um, it's easier to see benefits of a treatment um, that you're hoping for so much when they may not actually be there. Um, and so there's that expectancy bias, which you, you could say it's placebo effect, but it's really more expectancy. But then there's also the actual real placebo effect where the actual patient might um, do better or behave better because they're getting attention as being part of the study or their parent is, is kind of um, interacting with them in more healthy ways or whatever. And so you could have an actual placebo effect as well. So if you remember back to college, um, if you took introductory psychology, you might remember this horse, Clever Hans. And Clever Hans uh, couldn't really do math. Uh, it looked like he could do math because the trainer would give him a problem and he would stomp out the right answer. And it was like, oh my gosh, this horse can do math. But it turned out that the horse really just could, very, was very sensitive at picking up what the expectations of the trainer was. Um, and so that's kind of the situation that we might be having in some of these trials. So I found this great quote that I love so much. Everything you look for and all that you perceive has a way of proving whatever you believe. And, um, you know, this, this is a great quote for life, but uh, it's really um, important for us as scientists to realize that because, um, you know, we, we want to see something so badly. We, we, Sometimes we'll keep looking till we find it. And so that's a kind of a word of caution for us. Um, so this placebo effect um, is really kind of an interesting topic to me. And I had Rebecca, who's in my lab, um, do, this is not published or anything, but I wanted her to do a review. And so she pulled together uh, all, I think it was 10 of the largest um, controlled trials that have been done recently in people with intellectual disabilities. And you can see the information here, like what kind of medicine it was, um, what type of outcome measure. These are all behavioral outcome measures. And amazingly, um, the average amount of improvement in the placebo group, the group that got the sugar pill or the whatever kind of pill it is that doesn't have any drug in it, um, was 26% on average. And there was some kids who had, or adults who had even more of an improvement than that. Um, you can see the range, 14 to 46%. And the effect size, the effect size is telling us how big, like what's the magnitude of change in the trial for the placebo groups was 0.7. And 0.7 is like a really nice effect size for a treated group. Like that's what you hope to see in your drug treated group. And so, this is what we're kind of faced with in a lot of the clinical trials in that the treatment arm of the study, you know, if you randomize to drug or placebo, that treatment arm has to compete against or with the um, placebo effect or expectancy bias. And so that's where the, you know, going back again, that's where the cognitive measures can really help because we don't um, think we're going to see nearly the kind of 
placebo effects because of the objectivity of them. Um, so in terms of IQ, I promised I would talk about that too. Um, in short-term studies, um, you know, lots of the clinical trials involve maybe four weeks of treatment or even six weeks of treatment. But to really see if an uh, intervention, like a behavioral intervention or a cognitive intervention or, or a drug, is really changing cognitive functioning, we really need a lot more time. And over these long time horizons, I think um, uh, investigators, may, investigators may wanna choose like an IQ test to see if there's gains or stability without um, uh, loss of IQ, that kind of thing. And so what are the issues there? Um, <clears throat> so in a healthy, typical population over time, you might see the IQ average around 100 and it might kind of bounce up and down a little bit, um, but you're gonna kind of stay about there. In a, um, in a uh, group of people with intellectual disabilities who are not treated, what you usually see is um, kind of a modest decrease in IQ over time. And the reason for that is that um, whereas there actually are learning and acquiring skills and, you know, and developing cognition, um, the rate of improvement is not as steep as a typical child. So the gap between typical development and um, intellectual disability or one of those uh, groups is gonna get bigger and bigger, and then when the gap get bigger, gets bigger, the score goes down. Um, so what you might wanna like to see in a um, long-term treatment study is stability. You, if you had um, stability in the IQ over time, that would mean that they're actually progressing at a more typical rate. Um, maybe you get a little bump up and that would be like totally amazing. That would be, I mean, signs that things are really helping tremendously. The problem is that most of the tests that we use are uh, normed without uh, children or adults with disabilities. Um, as I mentioned before, they don't measure IQ below 40. And um, in those that do measure lower IQ, the performance range is narrow. And what I mean there is if a person is lower functioning and they can do the initial items on a test, they may quickly sealing out and stop um, doing the test because it got hard too fast. And then those individuals don't have as much of an opportunity to show what they can and can't do. And so you kind of get less confident about what you're, what you're getting from the score. Um, this was a test we published back in 2008 uh, which really opened our eyes to this problem, and it's actually from the study that I mentioned at the beginning in my story. Um, and what you see here in this sample of um, kids and teenagers with uh, Fragile X syndrome is the percent here of individuals who had the lowest possible scaled score. And you can see there, um, they're very, very high percentages. Um, and then on the left here is all the males, and the right is females. So the females didn't have much of a problem, but you can see how high the percentages are for the males to get the lowest score. But if you look at the actual range in their raw scores, what they actually are able to do, you know, item by item on the test, there's actually a big uh, range. Um, so there's something there that's not being captured. And so we developed a method to um, re, a new method for scoring IQ tests in people with uh, lower functioning intellectual disabilities that basically remedi or ameliorates that problem. It um, tremendously improves the situation. So for example, on arithmetic on the left, you see the distribution of scores in the Fragile X group. And then on the right is our new score, which I'll explain in a minute, and how much variation and distribution there is there with the new method. If you look at the correlations, um, you can see here this floor effect at 40, and then uh, without the floor effect, you get a much nicer um, sort of spread in this correlation between um, I, the full-scale IQ and the Vineland, which is their adaptive behavior level. So then we um, 
had some trouble with the publisher. <laughs> the publisher did not feel comfortable with this um, at, at that time. Um, they felt like it would get misused. Um, we did a press release that made them nervous. So they actually, at that time, stopped the permission that they had given us. And so I just said, you know, fine, when you're ready, <laughs> come back to us. So we actually started working with the publisher of the Stanford Binet, and they were all on board. I mean, they really liked the idea of kind of seeing what we could learn from this. So we actually got data from the Agree Autism um, Repository, and then we um, studied a new sample of kids with Fragile X Syndrome. You can see the numbers there. And um, this just shows you the percentage of uh, participants that were at the floor um, on those, at those IQ levels. So here's how the method works. Um, you get permission from the publisher to use their standardization data, which is uh, for each age group from childhood through uh, adulthood. Um, you're getting the mean of that normal sample and the standard deviation. Um, and then you are calculating the deviation of each individual's performance from uh, the standardization sample. If you take a, let's say, a 10-year-old child, you would look up their, uh, the, the standardization data for 10-year-olds, and there would be a mean and a standard deviation for that test, and then you would calculate the difference between how your child performed versus the mean, and divide it by the standard deviation from the sample, the standardization sample. That tells you how, how many standard deviations below normal their performance was. So in this case, this child's performance on this test was four and a quarter standard deviations below um, average for her age. And you just uh, do that for all the tests for all your uh, participants. And um, thankfully, the, you know, we have computers that can run all this uh, for us automatically. It looks up the right you know, data from the standardization table and basically generates all these deviation scores um, for us. And so what did the distributions look like? Well, a lot better. So here's this, you don't have to know too much about what this kind of plot is, but um, here are all these tests that are um, scored at the floor at 40. And then here are all those same kids who are falling more on the normal curve with the new method. Um, and just more examples of improved correlations with other measures, you can see there. So here's um, a case example, okay? So Jake, who's 19 years old, has Fragile X Syndrome. Um, on the top, you can see he scored at the floor for the full-scale IQ. Um, the EXIQ is something that the Stanford Binet tried to develop um, to get more sensitive scores at the upper end and the very low end. And um, I'll show you why I think that that's not useful at all in a minute. But at any rate, he got an EXIQ of 10. Um, but you can see up there on the right, he got a deviation score of 33.76. So what happens if you just take all the kids in your study who all got 40, like at the floor of the test? But if you look at the new score, you actually see there's this big distribution below 40. And you would ask yourself, well, is that meaningful variation or is that just some like artifact? And we think that it actually is meaningful because if you take this subgroup that all had a, a full-scale of 40, and you correlate with Vineland, of course, it's all gonna be zero correlation because there's no variation here because it's all 40. But if you correlate with the deviation IQ, um, you see these um, positive significant numbers, which means that variation actually is tapping into something uh, meaningful for those kids or adults. Here's kind of more evidence that the EXIQ isn't really doing much so I get to wrap up now. Um, this is my great team. Um, some of them have kind of moved on. So a really great team to work with. Um, I want to especially acknowledge Stephanie. Where is Stephanie? She's the redhead up there on the left. 
Um, she did, has done a lot of the statistics for the work that we do, um, and she's since moved on. We miss her a lot. And this is the group from Denver who's participating in the study now. And here are all the collaborators and, and support. Northwestern is where the toolbox was developed. So Richard Gershon and his team have um, all kinds of software developers and statisticians and things that help us. Um, we have a, a bunch of uh, consultants that have been re really pivotal either in the toolbox or other things. Um, and then other, other people that have helped tremendously on, on our projects. If you want to refer anybody um, or have um, kids or adults that you think would uh, be good to participate, um, they can contact Rebecca um, at that number and email. Do you do this test on these people when they have vision and or hearing problems as well? If so, what adaptations do you use? Um, so we actually, for the study, have excluded um, participants who don't have corrected vision. Um, and I, I don't know a lot about hearing and vision uh, issues with testing. Uh, I think that um, a lot of the tests could be done with, that, uh, with hearing impaired uh, participants as long as they understand what they're supposed to do because there's not really auditory input for a lot of them. Um, but, for example, uh, yeah, some of the instructions are read um, by the computer. Um, so, yeah, I got to think about that. There might be some um, information I could get from the developer about that for whoever that was. <laughs> Who raised your hand if you wrote that? Okay, yeah, maybe we can talk after. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that you did, uh, you you are working on, a, on clinical trials on Angelman syndrome. On what medication? And are there any cognitive tests that are working best with kids with Angelman? Um, so this test wouldn't be appropriate for them. Um, and I am not doing the trial myself, but um, I'm on a group or with a group of measure development experts who are exploring different options. One of them is, uh, and some adaptations to the Bailey uh, scales is being looked at. And then um, this group that I mentioned from Northwestern is interested in um, trying to develop some tests that are based on eye tracking that wouldn't involve any motor um, output or verbal output, but would just be um, you know, differentiating different images on the screen by looking or answering by eye movements. What is your opinion on our kids being given school standardized testing? Um, I, I think that they can be um, really valid and useful in a lot of situations. I think that the kids and adults who are um, in the kind of moderate, even some mild um, intellectually disabled range, um, they're really inadequate and are really misleading. And I think that um, it's time for the um, officials, I guess, with the school districts to start exploring other ways like this um, to measure uh, you know, individual strengths and weaknesses and change over time in kind of um, novel ways that um, are not, uh, not really getting enough attention. Um, you know, the example is, you know, you see a kid when they're, um, maybe eight or nine and you do cognitive testing and they get a 40 and you say, okay, they're, they're in the intellectually disabled range and here's all the services they can get and stuff. And so if, you want, if you're just trying to document that they have a disability, that's fine. But if you wanna measure like their strengths and weaknesses or are they improving in some areas over time, you have to have more sensitive scoring methods for that. Um, other one is now that my son has aged significantly, would testing at this point be helpful? And he's 29. Um, I guess it, it depends on um, what, what's needed. Um, if it's uh, something that has to do with qualification and um, it's been a long number of years and, and you need to um, get them requalified, I, I, I certainly think it would be helpful. Um, 
um, or if you want to see if he's had some gains because of some um, intervention, it would be helpful. Um, trying to think what else. Um, and it depends on what they're doing during the day, like if they have a job that involves some different skills, um, if the testing uh, is valid and reliable, you know, you might be able to learn kind of more strengths and weaknesses that could um, help them with good job, you know, kind of a helpful job placement where their skills can be taken advantage of or weaknesses avoided, I guess. So yes, I'm the mom with the Engelman uh, syndrome child. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the Bailey scale in Northwestern uh, uh, is uh, doing a trial. Yeah. Uh, as well as for eye tracking. Um, well, not yet. They're planning. They're planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can um, I know more about it and possibly see if my child can participate? And do you know anything about the age level that they're? Um, I don't. Um, probably the best thing to do is uh, send me an email, and okay. I can. Um, yeah, I just got to find out what the what the plans are, like how soon those studies are going to get started. Okay. Um, but if they, when they do start, I'm sure we'll have a site here at Davis uh, or in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. uh, are you from the area? Yes. Yeah, so we can just stay in touch, I think. Okay, I and I know. thought that I heard that uh, there was going to be an Angelman Syndrome Clinic at UC Davis. Um, have you heard anything different or um, that hasn't materialized or? I don't think it's materialized. I mean, I know that um, the clinical genetics team occasionally sees kids with or adults with Angelman syndrome, but I don't think there's a clinic that's specifically for Angelman okay. yet. Um, you mentioned that there was a way to help calculate those lower level scores on the Stanford Binet. Is that something that's like a UCD thing, or is that something that's broadly available to other people to use as well? Um, My stats are a little rusty. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, so the, the um, publisher of the Stanford Binet on the website where you can purchase it, mm -hmm. at the bottom there's a link where you can download all of the standardization scores. Okay. Um, the problem is, like if you have one kid, it would be quick, right. probably quick to do it, but um, if you wanted a more automated way, then we would have to share our um, little program that we wrote. Okay. Um, which I don't have a problem with, but I, I guess I should probably check with them to make sure we can distribute okay. that. Okay, yeah. I was just curious. Do you, do you also know um, when a Stanford Binet 6 might be coming out? <laughs> I keep asking them and they, and they were telling me that they wanted me to help participate in that when yeah. it was, you know, for these kind of reasons. Right. And I haven't heard anything and I don't see anything on their website and it's yeah. getting a little out of date. It is, yeah. So. I, I asked about two years ago um, when I was considering buying one, but I didn't want to buy one that was so old. So and yeah. they said they were re-standardizing, but the, yeah. it was spotty. Yeah, I'll have to check in with okay. them on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.